Hey everyone, welcome. Uh, it's after lunch, so I know it's hard to pay attention, but hopefully I'll we'll make it entertaining. I'm Gonzalo, I'll be introducing John in a second, and uh, I work for OverOps and we tell you when, where, and why your code breaks in production. Um, I'll show you three slides and I'll jump into a demo, which will be more interesting. This will only take five minutes and uh, the main presenter will be John for the next of the session. First, uh, as you're switching your release mode from monolithic to microservices and testing cycle to CI CD, you have uh, now introduced errors faster. We want to help you solve that, that, that new release cycle as you introduce errors faster, but also not forget that you have old code built by developers that have left, and you might be also have to support that old code as it's still uh, in production. We're also um, trying to so help you solve as um, how, how fast you detect those issues. Some of the issues are uh, very critical. Your customer will be calling, that's already too late, but sometimes even worse, your customer doesn't call and you don't know it's happening and it's hurting your customer satisfaction. Third piece, uh, it takes too long to identify what the root cause of those errors is. So you have the logs and they have some good information, but you have to filter through it and uh, do some um, guessing to the inside of why the error is happening behind the log in the first place. You also have um, monitoring tools that will give you the stack trace, but not the root cause of the error. So we're aiming to solve that issue uh, with overops. So I'll jump into the demo, um, jump into our system. So. What we do is we monitor the JVM at the JVM level, and we are detecting every time an error, old or new, it comes up in your environment. We are ca capturing 100% of the uh, errors, that is logged error, log warning, uh, caught exception, and uncaught exception. And we are doing this by monitoring also how your new deployments come into production. That allows us to tell you whenever you have a new deployment, and we have four deployments over the last two months in our environment, how many new errors did you introduce in each deployment? And allow you to select that deployment and jump into a view of the list of those errors. These errors are, are already deduplicated, meaning I don't have to write filters to know when an error is new. It comes from the code. This deduplication allows me to see the different stack traces that led to those errors. I'm calling an error again, a logged warning, a logged error, caught and uncaught exceptions. We're capturing 100% of them. We show you the name of it. We show you the location where it happened, how many times it happened, and the error rate, meaning from all the times that this method was called, how many of those times did it actually throw this error? This allows you to prioritize very fast if this is something that is important, if it's, if it's hurting your customer satisfaction, or impacting your business. We're also showing you when it was first introduced, when it happened for the first time, and if it's still happening today. So is this relevant right now? So, so far it's monitoring. Um, I'm sure you've seen uh, partly some of this before. We can make this monitoring proactive, meaning when there's a new error coming up, we can push that notification to your developer team, the right developer, by, via email, uh, Jira, Slack, whatever communication channel you use. Now, now the good part. Whenever you click on that link, that link that will be available on, on the Jira ticket, that email, or the dashboard, we will show you the stack trace, the code where it happened, the line where it happened. More important, we will be showing the variable value of every variable in the stack at the time that the error happened. And we're doing this for 100% of the errors the first time it happens. This is not a reactive process. We're doing this without any code changes, with a 1% overhead to your JVM. We're also giving you the last 250 lines of debug level log. This is information that you don't have in the files. You usually can afford, can't afford to write all this information at debug level in the files. However, we are extracting it from memory for every error that we capture. We are giving you proactive notification when an error happens, which allows you to be better at uh, solving those issues faster. As you're releasing faster, you have to do solve those issues faster, and releasing faster is key to your innovation path. 
We are also making you more efficient when you solve those errors. You can have all the information that you need to fix it on the first time immediately when you receive that link that has the variable state of every variable at the time it happened. Finally, we are detecting every error, even the ones that slip under because they, they don't pop up, they don't generate a lot of alerts, they don't drive a lot of customer calls, but they are impacting your customer satisfaction. So with that, um, this is our, some, some of our customers are already trusting us, and today John McCann will be uh, talking about the experience from Comcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Hey everyone, uh, my name is John McCann. I'm an engineering director at Comcast from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and work with the best engineering team I've ever come across in my career. Um, I work on the Xfinity TV X1 product and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what we do for deployment automation and monitoring uh, for our uh, highly scaled video, cloud-based video system uh, in production. Uh, X1 for Xfinity TV is Comcast's flagship video product. It replaces our legacy cable set top boxes with a brand new cloud-based technology that is driven entirely out of both public and private clouds. Everything from the user interface layer to the DVR scheduler to the back office data and all of the on-demand data is, um, is serviced from uh, microservices in the cloud. And um, so we have been working on this for about five or six years, and we've been incorporating lots of advanced features like voice search, personalized recommendations, and parental controls. Just to give you a sense of scale, we currently service about 22 and a half residential video customers. About half of those customers are using X1 devices. The other half are being transitioned from our legacy product. And uh, approximately 20 million on-demand video views are initiated every day. So let's talk a little bit about the voyage and how we got here. Uh, like, many, um, like many software projects, we had some pretty humble beginnings. We started off with a very monolithic stack. We had many different software components that were incorporated together into a, a single build system. The deployments took hours. It took an entire team just to prepare and deploy our releases. We had isolated silos. Organizationally, the team was divided into developers that reported to dev managers, QA engineers that reported to QA managers, ops teams that reported to ops managers, and so forth. This made collaboration challenging, and even simple tasks could uh, be very difficult to get through. We had a AB type of production deployment methodology um, where we had two identical environments, and we would do an in-place deployment. Challenges here were that if a deployment failed, there was really no good way to roll back. If we lost a data center, we were effectively hard down, and even losing a blade would be a SEV1. At some point, we realized that enough was enough, um, and we introduced a much better system for the X1 production system. So, for example, we had to dismantle the entire uh, application stack into smaller services and we had to reorganize teams into cross-functional pods. So uh, this was a big organizational change that had an enormous impact on how we do our work. Uh, the cross-functional pods were comprised of small development teams with uh, QA and product uh, managers integrated onto the team, and each team was fully responsible for the end-to-end -end ownership of their specific service or the specific feature that they were assigned. And that included um, development, QA, operations, monitoring, and support responsibilities. This empowers team to make better choices uh, or make their own choices. It gives them more autonomy, um, less top-down management. Um, and it provides um, a sense of responsibility um, and accountability for the teams to make sure that their services remain stable and working properly in production. We also developed a homegrown deployment automation system that I'm going to be talking about a little bit um, and we based it on the philosophy that uh, development environments or production environments should be treated as immutable. Um, it's the cattle, not pets model. And we had a few important requirements that were put together when we, um, when we set out to build this system. Um, one requirement was we had to be able to roll out releases very quickly. 
Um, secondly, we had to scale quickly to new data centers because we knew that X1 was going to grow exponentially from a few thousand um, customers to tens of millions. We're a pretty traditional um, Java Linux software stack. Um, we use Cassandra for uh, many of our services uh, for persistence layer. Um, and our solution really needed to work on multiple different cloud technologies, both public and private. So we run on OpenStack, AWS, and VMware clouds for a variety of reasons. Um, we embrace the heterogeneity of the infrastructure, um, and we required a deployment automation solution that would work well within this heterogeneous infrastructure. Deployment automation also needs to integrate very well with our, um, with our monitoring solutions. So OverOps, Zabbix, and Splunk are our uh, monitoring solutions of choice, OverOps for application and JVM, JVM level monitoring, uh, Zabbix for instance and OS level monitoring, and Splunk for, for our logs, of course. Um, so the solution we came up with looks a little bit like this. Basically, there's an abstraction layer that provides a consistent API for working with the various clouds that we run on. Uh, systems built in Scala, Akka, and Cassandra, and then it uses Puppet and Hira to do the um, automation of the software that needs to be installed and configured on the instances as they're created. Um, on top of that, we developed a flexible orchestration layer that knows how the application should be scaled and configured. Um, it's based on the Activity um, Business Process Management uh, BPM solution. Um, it's a very flexible XML-based system for um, orchestrating workflows and uh, allowing those workflows to be backed by custom Java code. Uh, and then there's a relational database that maintains um, data about what environments are up, how many instances are in those environments, you know, what's taking traffic and what isn't. And then on top of that, we built a set of tools uh, to, to provide user interface and a dashboard for the teams that are um, managing the production environments. And so uh, that's built in Ruby and Sinatra uh, and Bootstrap. And it provides, you know, at a glance, uh, a clear view of what's going on in production, uh, what systems are what. Um, but we weren't quite done. We had our deployments automated, but we fell victim to the common misconception that the release cycle ends when code is deployed to production. Uh, this is, of course, wrong. <laughs> Um, that's when things really get interesting and, um, and the so-called monsters, uh, monster errors come to life. Um, so really what we needed was a monitoring solution that would, would help with that. And um, we needed a solution that would provide for us insight into both the known and unknown ways that the application could fail. So we used um, Zabbix and Splunk and a homegrown real-time telemetry system for all the known ways that the application can fail with predictable uh, failure points. But what we really needed was a mechanism for detecting all of the things that we hadn't thought about um, in terms of failure conditions. And that's what OverOps provides for us. Thinking back to what monitoring was like before Splunk, I'm sure you guys have all uh, been through this. <laughs> Multiple SSH windows, tailing logs, grepping logs to try to look for effectively a needle in a haystack. <laughs> um, Splunk changed the game dramatically, being able to <laughs> use Splunk queries to get at the root of some of your problems was an incredible step forward. Um, but one of the fundamental challenges with Splunk is that the alerts are based on, for the most part, types of failures that you need to know about um, in, in advance. There are COD exceptions, log, error, you know, uh, you know, log statements that are written to the um, error log and so forth. And you know, there's really no, uh, you can set up dashboards, but there's no detailed way to see um, all of the specifics about what's going on when exceptions occur. And so OverOps fills in um, those gaps and sort of rounds us out um, and provides us with what I'm considering a complete automated release pipeline. Um, what's important with a release pipeline is that each step along the way, there's an automated mechanism to validate that the step worked correctly. So for example, um, we start off with um, development and build uh, steps uh, using Bamboo, and unit and integration tests are there to catch any regressions or any problems that would happen there. You move on to a release automation and then automated sanity tests that validate that your release uh, worked correctly. We have our homegrown deployment automation solution and then automated stack validation for the uh, actual deployments. And then we release our um, software to Canary or community groups prior to going to all customers. 
Um, and we have our production monitoring solutions, OverOps, Zabbix, and Splunk, in place to identify any potential regressions or problems that would require us to roll back. And then even rolling out to customers, it's important that um, traffic shaping is used to roll out new features to a percentage of customers at a time. Uh, so that brings us to a few uh, set of core principles that we embrace at uh, Comcast. And um, the first one, as I mentioned, is traffic shaping. Um, you never want to put a release out to all customers all at once. Uh, traffic shaping is critical in uh, allowing you to uh, try out new features and identify regressions quickly. And if you find a regression, fail fast. Um, so you know, if anything looks unhealthy, metrics don't look quite right, um, ro roll back immediately is, is the way to go. Another core principle that's important is, is immutable environments. Um, so the idea with this is we don't want people to, we don't want engineers to be SSHing to production systems and making changes um, on the fly. In fact, we don't want environments to be touched at all after they've been created. Once you've deployed a version of the software, um, you put traffic on it, you take traffic off of it when you're done with that version, and you just delete those, in those instances that you don't need anymore and replace them with a new version of your software and traffic shape to that version. So why do we embrace OverOps in X1? Um, one very concrete example um, deals with uh, how we monitor, monitor the um, remote control battery voltage. You'd be astounded how many calls our call centers take for customers who um, have broken remotes. Um, well, um, a very large percentage of the time, just replacing the batteries addresses the problem. So we've um, introduced remote control battery voltage monitoring so that we can notify customers when the battery voltage gets low and it's time to, um, to replace the batteries in the remote. So in this particular example, um, a firmware build went out to um, the set-top boxes that changed how the remote voltage uh, levels were being conveyed to the user interface application um, under conditions where the, where the voltage was extremely low. It would be um, sent up as a, it was being serialized as an integer instead of a long. So when the user interface was um, unmarshalling the uh, data, it was tossing an exception. So what OverOps provided for us was all of the data on the stack that helped us identify that this was a pretty straightforward fix. We just make sure that we can handle cases where the data is serialized um, as, as an integer instead of a long. And so we were effectively able to identify the problem right away. We had a sufficient level of detail to address the problem quickly. And in doing so, we were able to put out a fix that we felt fairly confident would address the problem. Another thing I'm very excited about with, with OverOps is being able to track down what I call the long tail of problems. Lots of times folks will look at the most frequent exceptions or frequent errors um, in, in, in their software stack. And that's great to do. But what ends up happening is lots of times the less frequent errors get buried and don't get the attention they deserve. These are potentially. Um, impacting customers in a negative way, and they don't necessarily get um, the opportunity to set off alarms in production, and they aren't the types of errors that um, you would necessarily find in common Splunk queries. So um, what we do is we use OverOps to see this long tail of issues so that we can identify the ones that have customer impact and address them quickly. And um, this, the, the OverOps dashboard you know, allows you to sort by how frequently the error occurred so that you can see both your, your, your common, you know, highly frequent errors as well as the long tail. So really to summarize, OverOps for X1 provides you know, three really important um, components of a monitoring system. Um, the issues that OverOps reports carry the level of detail that a developer needs and has grown accustomed to in using their debugger. Uh, to figuring out exactly how to fix it. Um, prior to OverOps, we didn't really have a solution that did that for us. Uh, and new problems that uh, surface in production are discovered quickly with a little bit of vigilance on the part of the dev teams. You can stay on top of all of the errors that crop up as a result of a new release so that you can, um, so that you can get those fixed in, in, in a hot patch or a maintenance release. Uh, and finally, it provides visibility into the long tail of issues that uh, may have otherwise uh, gone undetected.
So uh, that's it for me. If you're interested in finding out more, you know, we'll, the, the fine folks from OverOps have a booth here, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Also, if you are a developer interested in working in the Philadelphia area, we are very much hiring at Comcast. So please get in touch with me about that. Yeah. And we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Brian. And, uh, we, we, we have some time, so uh, hopefully there are questions. And uh, we have a microphone that we can pass along so um, everyone can hear. Um, but uh, hopefully, from the demo or from the presentation, you have a question. Yeah, please. Do you use all open source, like your Jenkins is open source? Yes, exactly. So um, pretty much mo mostly open source shop. We, we um, have experimented with various you know, other commercial solutions, but we almost always land on, on open source solutions for most of what we're doing in X1. Some of the back office pieces are, of course, you know, um, not open source. But um, as far as the customer experience is concerned, the UI layer and um, most of the data access layers, open source. Do you allow the developers to um, we highly discourage um, <laughs> developers to remotely SSH into the boxes, and at some point, we're um, really driving towards shutting down the SSH daemon and even running on um, read-only file systems, um, just because that's the, one of the most secure ways to run uh, in production is if you've got a read-only file system. But we um, haven't quite gotten there yet, but it's um, a rare occurrence to have to SSH to a production server. Yeah. So this is more of a cultural question, less of a technical one. So earlier on in, in your slides, you talked about moving from separate teams where you have developers, QA, support, et cetera, mm -hmm. combining them into cross-functional teams. Mm -hmm. Did you run into any resistance from the developers when they were then asked to take on support roles and mm -hmm. QA roles, mm -hmm. take them away from some of their development time? Yeah, I mean, there was definitely a learning curve, especially with um, getting used to monitoring production and working in potentially production systems. A lot of times, uh, developers are reluctant to take on those responsibilities. Uh, so it did take a little while um, to convince people that it was the right model. It, we had to ease into it as well. So we started with a pilot team and demonstrated that it worked with that team and then sort of expanded as we go. It wasn't something that just happened overnight. Um, but you know, over the course of a couple of years, we were able to transition um, a, a large percentage of the teams to the to the new pod-based model. And in, in the end, I, I do think developers are um, a lot happier with it, or f for the most part. Yeah. So, yes. I, did you guys borrow the Spotify model? With this? The Spotify model? Yeah. Um, if we did, it was inadvertent. <laughs> Um, I, can you say more about the Spotify model? Well, the Spotify model does that. Uh, we're going through the transition in our firm today. Okay. And it's not going over well at all. Oh, so, really? <laughs> <laughs> developers don't want to be woken up to fix a problem. That's true. We're here trying to find tools and solutions to kind of help them be able to solve the problems a little bit more efficiently and be able to leaders know uh, what's going on from the ground. That's true. Um, we put in an on-call rotation, if it helps, where um, a developer is on call for a week at a time, and they, they're only going to be woken up during that period, and they can sort of prepare ahead of time, and then they know they're not going to get a call under normal circumstances when they're not on call, if that helps. <laughs> Did the buy-in start from the top? Was it a mandate from um, the leaders of the world? It, it, the, well, conceptually it did um, start up there, and, and to a certain extent, for, for a lot of teams it was. Um, but other teams it happened a little more um, uh, naturally, I say. Uh, I, think if, um, I think with enough patience and um, uh, sort of leading by example, you know, it, it's a little easier to convince a team to embrace a new model than a top-down you know, imposing of a new way of working. So we tried to sort of have a few pilot teams that would lead by example and then sort of encourage teams to follow that model as opposed to saying, OK, you know, reboot, here's the new way of working. Not sure if that helps. Yeah, yeah. So now that you have a, a, a team that works with QA people and also developers and all the things, uh, every single team member is able to write code and do all the things, or they have uh, responsibilities that are missing <laughs> from 
<laughs> they still have responsibilities on the team. So, you know, if you think about uh, what a pod might look like, it would be, you know, a couple of developers whose job it is to write the code, you know, one or two QA engineers who are doing the testing, uh, but they are, um, working with the developers to the extent that they understand what the application logs say, they understand the uh, implications of um, various types of failures and exceptions and so forth. Um, and then we'll generally embed a product engineer who's providing all the requirements and oftentimes a designer who is providing the, the, the visual specifications. Um, and, so, and so that's what a pod would look like. And so everyone within that group has their own roles and responsibilities. Um, and you know, by and large, the developers are responsible for um, the operational aspects of it, you know, and um, you know, deploying things to production, monitoring, and um, and the on-call rotation. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that the roles and responsibilities across the pods remain consistent? Mm -hmm. Um, so there still is a um, dev manager who all of the engineers and QA individuals report to. Um, and those uh, pods, I, each engineering manager will have two to three to four pods that they're ultimately responsible for, but they're providing, providing managerial duties and um, oversight, and they're less uh, involved in um, the day-to-day -day decision making. Um, so it's really the, de de you know, the manager's responsibility to remain vigilant and see if things aren't um, working out and you know, we need to make a change. The pods that you mentioned are are those engineers also supporting like the overall platform. So we have um, a handful of folks who are reserved. There's there's a sort of dedicated team for managing some of the shared um, infrastructure, some of the shared services like Splunk and OverOps and Zabbix, right? So there's a team that's just providing those as a service, and the development teams really are empowered to choose, in a lot of cases, the monitoring solution that's most appropriate for them. Um, but by and large, with X1, at least on the um, user interface services, they're you know, using OverOps and, um, and, and Splunk and Zabbix from um, you know, the, the team that is providing that as a service for the company. OK. All right. Well, that's it then. Well, as uh, oh. Sean said, if you are curious about having a, a, a demo 101, we have a booth out there, and uh, we we can we can answer more questions. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank